Have you ever had those moments that you just think that God is not answering your prayers? We've all had those moments and we've all had our struggles. And you know what bugs me the most about this? Is the typical answers that we get. The typical Christianese answer to this says, yes, God says yes, God says no, or God says wait. Well, I have to tell you, I am so done with that response, especially when I have seen prayers that I thought God really should answer them. And why are these horrific things happening in this world? And why is the answer not coming? And today with me, you're absolutely going to love it because I have a guest with me today, Robert Henderson. He's an apostle that will explain to you what actually is meant by when God feels like he doesn't answer. What is it that holds back your prayers? Robert, thank you so much for coming to the show. It's good to be here. Thank you. I am so glad you're here. And, and my question to you is, what is the problem? Yeah, you know, when you said that, I actually wrote that in the forward of the book. On you operating did? In the courts. Yeah, I said, I literally said, um, you know, that the standard answer has been yes, no, or wait. Yeah. And I, too, am like, there's something wrong with that, uh, that whole idea. Yeah. Because, see, I believe that if we are praying prayers that are in agreement with God's word, that we know that they're in agreement with what, with what God said, that that if they are not being answered, it's because something legal is resisting us in the spirit realm. Now, that's brand new language to me, because legal what? Don't we just yep. turn to God? Yeah, because in the book of Luke, when Jesus taught on prayer, when the disciples said in Luke chapter 11, teach us to pray, Jesus put a prayer in two dimensions in Luke 11. He said, when you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven. So the first dimension of prayer is approaching God as Father. We're fairly aware of that. Yeah. But then he says in Luke, Luke 11, 5 through 8, and when you pray, uh, he said uh, that you approach God as friend. In other words, he said, he said that, that which of you having a friend that would come to him that you would at midnight, and he didn't have anything to help him, he would get up and go to another friend. So he put prayer into a relationship with God as friend. So the first two dimensions are approach God as father, approach God as friend. And there's a lot of different things in there. But then... Jesus picks it back up in Luke chapter 18, and he begins to teach on prayer again. And he said that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. And he began to tell a story of a widow who came before an unjust judge. And mm -hmm. finally, finally, she got a verdict from the unjust judge. And God, uh, or Jesus... Wasn't she, like, persistent? She was persistent. She kept presenting her case because that's what you do before a judge. You present cases before him. But is that like me praying the same prayer over and over again? That sounds kind of redound redundant. No, no. Almost. See, see, what happens is that is that when you approach God as judge, you're presenting your case. Oh, okay, you come before it. Him yes. and you present a case. You're saying, Lord, this is what Your Word says. Uh, this is what Jesus did for us on the cross. But she had an adversary, and that's the Greek word in, there in Luke 18. That's the Greek word antidikos, hmm. A-N-T-I-D-I-K-O-S, and it means one who brings a lawsuit. Peter oh, actually wow. used that word in 1 Peter 5, 8, when he said that, you, that the devil is the antidikos, the adversary, who is seeking the right to devour. So the devil cannot devour at will. He has to find a legal right to build a case against us mm -hmm. to devour. What this woman did, she undid the case that was against her. And of course, God wasn't saying that God's a, a unjust judge we have to convince. He was yeah. saying, if this widow could get a verdict from an unjust judge, how much wow. more can we come before God, the judge of all, and have him render verdicts in our behalf? So, wow. So that kind of talks because, um, you know, it, it reads here, I looked the other day at Hannah, mm -hmm. just last night. I said, Lord, show me a scripture. And I went right to Hannah. Hannah's praying. She's going to the enter. She's entering the place to prayer. And she's upset. Yeah. She is upset. And you've been talking about trading, yes. which was brand new to me. Is it Hannah? Why don't I just share it right here? Yeah. It says, O Lord of Heaven's armies, and she's making a vow here, O Lord of Heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer, she must have prayed this before, right. and give me a son that I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. Wow, she signed him up. Is this trading? I, uh, yeah, I believe it is. I think that whenever she made the vow and the commitment to give Samuel to the Lord, she traded him. And, of course, if you go ahead and read the story, uh, she actually had several more children after this. Right. And when her, when her, when her huh. womb opened up, she became fruitful. And, and yet she traded 
her son into the purposes of God. I always say about Hannah that what, what God did was when she cried out to God and God answered her, that she got the desire of her heart, but God, God received his need to have a voice to shape nations. And that's wow. what the Lord does. Sometimes he allows us to go into bitterness of soul and into places where there's unanswered prayers to bring us to the place mm -hmm. where we're willing to do what needs to be done. Not only so our needs can be met and desires can be met, but so God gets what he needs for his purposes to be done in the earth. Because what came out of that was huge. That's right. But that tr that whole trading is foreign to yes. me. You know, it's it's new. It's I've never saw God before. I give this to you if you did this for me. Yes. So explain it a little bit more. Well, see, in, in first of all, there's trading in the heavenly realm. Mm -hmm. Because we, we see in Ezekiel chapter 28, I think about verse 14, uh, 16, excuse me, uh -huh. where that before Satan was cast out of heaven, when he was still Lucifer, which that uh -huh. means he was in God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. He was, he was uh, some say, an archangel in God's kingdom. The Bible says that he traded. And so... There's something about trading in the spirit realm. So many times when we step into prayer, um, that there are times when we step on what we are actually calling a trading floor, mm -hmm. uh, where that that a dimension opens up and that we can actually sow financial seed, uh, those kind of things, that the faith attached to that, that giving uh, is a trade in the spirit realm that gives God, based on the sound of that money being offered, it gives God the legal right to render verdicts in our behalf. Wow. And see, the, the, what you have to understand about that is that the Bible, the Bible actually uh, says that money has a sound attached to it. Wow. Uh, in J James chapter 5, the Bible talks about the wages that have been held back by those uh, that had, had worked for others and, the, and they were holding the wages back. The Bible says in James 5 that those wages are crying out. In other words, wow. they're wanting to get yeah. to their right place. They have a sound attached to them. And so many times we don't understand our money, when we give it, has a sound attached to it that is releasing testimony wow. in the courts of heaven and giving God the legal wow. right to and render And there's verdicts. a lot more to that. Isn't this an interesting point, what we're talking about right now? Brand new stuff. But guess what? It is time to get real and to do the real deal and no longer no phony baloney. Stay tuned. You want to hear the rest. You know, as a culture, we've been through a whole lot these last few months. And I really want to encourage you to look up, don't be depressed, uh, maybe even turn off the news channels, and uh, be, be confident that our Father has everything in control. The Lord gave me a, a word the other day that we're in a season of divine disruption. In fact, I spoke at a conference a while back, and I actually used the word apocalypse. People think that apocalypse is the end of the age, but it's really not. It's a time where things get shaken up so that the new can be revealed. And that's what I believe God's doing in this day. Everything seems to be shaken. Even the Word of God says that He, he will shake everything and only what's to remain will remain. Barb TV is gonna be a great uh, expression uh, of not only a prophetic word to the culture, it's gonna be awesome to come here and learn to see what's relevant. How would you like to get your answer, prayers answered? You know, there are all these prayers. We have them. And actually, there was a statistic done in 2005 that 53% of prayers did not feel, those people felt like their prayers were not answered. Isn't it time that we step into our legal rights that God has given us to start entering the courts of heaven, which might be quite foreign to you, and starting to learn how to get your prayer answered to. Robert Henderson is with us, which is an apostle, and he has taught me so much in just a couple of weeks that I've learned about him, and I know he will transform your life through, through Christ. Robert, you started all about this, and you actually kind of were thrown into this in learning about this. Tell me a little bit what happened with your son. Well, I've been praying as a, as a prayer warrior, as a person of prayer, for since 1980. Wow. I mean, uh, I mean, God, whenever he called me to the ministry and I said yes, yeah. I knew that I was called to prayer more than anything else. Um, and so we've had seen a lot of successes, lots of breakthroughs. But a few years back, my son, through a series of circumstances, ended up in really deep depression. He was, mm -hmm. He's not given to that. That's not really who he is. 
but he had gone through a divorce. He actually had gone through a divorce, and he mm -hmm. was in ministry, and he and his wife had ended up divorced. She had decided she didn't want to do ministry and all that kind of thing. So it was a very devastating thing for him. So he did not want the divorce. No, 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 not at all. He he tried everything in his power, and for a long, long time, you know, wanted reconciliation, but she just had didn't have a heart for it. And so, uh, but he was he just ended up in a real deep place of depression. Mm. Uh, he would work at a convenience store uh, from from three to eleven, come home, stay up you know, late hours, and then not even come out of his room until it was time to go back to work. I mean, just complete depression. And I tried everything I knew. That's to quite him. a switch from ministry yes. to nothing. Nothing, that's right. He felt, he felt that God was through with him. He felt that, that it was so messed up that he could never be used Isn't again. Is that a life from the enemy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because that wasn't God's heart. I tried to encourage him. I tried to tell him God wasn't. You know, I've been in ministry my whole adult life for the most part, and and he just, he couldn't hear it. I mean, he was so devastated. And so, but in prayer, I did everything I know to do. I mean, at that, at that time, I was binding, I was loosing, I was, you know, opening and shutting. I was I was crying, I was yelling, I was whispering. I was doing everything, everything I knew to do. And did nothing, it work? No, nothing worked. He, he got worse and worse. It got, it just got to the point. Wasn't that frustrating? Because you were, you've been a pastor for oh, like yeah. a long time. You have an apostolic center. Yeah. You have all this stuff. Right. And then nothing worked. It wasn't working. Did it that was, bring doubt to your mind or frustration? Not doubt. It was. I never doubted God. I just thought, what am I not doing right? Mm. You know, why? Why is it not working? I know God's word is true. Yeah. And I never questioned that. And we. And I never blamed God. But I. My attitude was there must be something I don't know about. Something that's not working. And so for two years this went on, and things just pro progressively got worse. Well, I went to prayer again one morning, as I always did, and for whatever reason, this particular morning, I felt I heard the Lord say, bring Adam to my courts. That was the word I heard. Wow. And I had started seeing a little bit about it, so I kind of knew a little bit about it. So I, what I did was I, I began to repent for Adam. Now, some people say, well, how can you repent for someone else? And I said, well, we, we pray for people all the time. Yeah. And, and I said, you know, the prophets stood in the gap. They made up the breach in behalf of people. So I just began to repent for Adam. I repented for any place he had maybe not been a good husband or not been a good father. Or instead of putting blame on somebody else, we, I was taking the responsibility. And you just did this on earth or kind of going into the courts well, of heaven? Well, by faith. By faith you're in heaven, but in, in, in the courts of heaven. But I'm very much in earth. I mean, I'm aware yeah. of my, my surroundings. surroundings. I wasn't in a trance or anything. And do you, do, I'm just wondering, because mm -hmm. when you actually go to God, it's almost like, you know, are you worthy enough? Do you just right. clean, you know? Or do you have to first repent yourself before you even repent it for your son? Well, I, I you know, when, every time I pray, I ask the Lord, you know, come before our Heavenly Father, that kind of thing. And so, so I, I, because I know who I am in the Lord, because I'm aware of what His blood uh -huh. has done for me, mm. then I, by faith, can just take that position that He's given. Yeah. And because one of the problems we have as the church, as God's people, is that we really don't know who we are and that we have rights to come before him and boldly make requests. That's what it says in Hebrews 4. Come boldly before the throne of grace. Wow. Let, your, let your needs be known. Uh, uh, obtain mercy mm -hmm. from the throne of grace. And so I, bold, I understood that, so I boldly come. So I just began to repent for Adam. I repented for you know anything I could think of. It took me only about five minutes. And wow. when I got through doing that, the Lord then said to me, he said, now you repent. And I thought, well, what have I done in this situation? And he said, you repent for all the negative things you have said oh. about Adam to his mother. Because I had said things to my wife about Adam. You know, like, I don't understand why he did this, why he did this, why he did this. You know, he wasn't right when he did this. And I was very critical of Adam behind the scenes. I would have never have said that to his mother, or to him. Yeah. But I'd say that, I was saying that to his mother. And then the Lord said something that changed my life. He said, when you spoke evil or wrongly or, or, or critically of Adam, the enemy, the adversary, the Antidikos, took those words before my courts and said, even Used his them own against you? Yes. And said, even wow. his own father says this about him. Wow. And he built a case against Adam based on my words. Wow. And I learned so much when I, because I picked your book up about mm -hmm. four weeks ago, five weeks ago. I picked your book up, told all my prayer partners, you've got to mm -hmm. read this book. And all I did was go online. I said, I've been praying for my daughter now for eight years. Mm -hmm. It is terrible where we're at currently. Mm -hmm. It, it, and the, the grandkids, it's just 
bad all the way around, right. you know, and it gets worse. What is the problem? What, don't, what is it that I don't get? Mm -hmm. But your book, you know, Entering the Courts of Heaven, and started reading it, and my, my mouth pretty much dropped to the floor. I'm like, why don't I know this? Yeah. You know, it's brand new. So when you said about the negativity mm -hmm. that you were talking about a torch afterwards, I have done that for eight years. Yeah. And I, I was to the point of crying, yeah. being a gossip over my own kid, basically, that, right? right? Yeah, and, and what happens, see, that becomes the legal thing, that when I say legal, that the devil uses to build cases. Yes. And so I had to repent for that. And I did that in tears. I was so sorry when right. I realized I was a part of the problem. Chokes you up. Yeah, I was the one time. messing up. Wow. And, and so I did that. And, and what I got through then with, with those two things, repenting for Adam uh -huh. and then repenting for my own stuff. Uh -huh. Then the Lord said to me, now, he said, he told me, he said, prophesy Adam's destiny. Wow. And I want to hear more about okay. that. Prophesy Adam's destiny. Prophesize your problem's destiny. Stay tuned. You want to hear more. Hi, my name is Gianna, and I'm so glad that you're watching this. I absolutely love being in this chair. This is my second time around at the show, and I really enjoy sharing my story. I think there's something very beautiful about people coming in the chair and just sharing, being transparent, sharing about God, sharing about real struggles that we all face. Um, I just want to encourage you to like the Facebook page, to like the Instagram page, and if you are down, depressed, um, sad, angry, come watch the show. This will change your life. This will help you understand about God's love and that there is forgiveness and there is healing and it's not the end. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're watching, to just trust God and um, just know that He is capable and able to do anything and everything. And thank you so much for watching. And I just, I'm praying for you. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about Hannah and her prayers really not getting answered. And instead of things getting better, they got worse. Now there is a second wife in the picture and she has plenty of kids. And, you know, it's almost like she was slapped in the face. And every time she would go to the annual celebrations to praise and worship God, the other woman was like, nah, 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 nah. and it just got in her face to the point she was to tears. And instead of celebrating, she was mourning and it got to her. But then she traded on the floor and took it to God and, and made a sacrifice to the Lord and God answered. He answered and I love as she gives praise afterwards right before she gives her own child to a situation to Eli and gives him to the Lord to start worshiping and, and serving God right there and I think it's called Shiloh or something like that and she starts totally, she gives him up not in this way, but in uh, that way. And she sings this incredible, she has this incredible word of praise. And I want to give you just a touch of that to see if you catch on to what the words that are being said. And it says in 1 Samuel 2, in starting at the first verse, my heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Whoa, what a switch. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. And then a little bit on the next page, it says this, for all the earth is the Lord's and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Those who fight against the Lord will be shattered. He thunders against them from heaven. The Lord judges throughout the earth. Now, Robert, yes. you, this is what you're talking about. Yes. And so last night when I'm tired, getting ready for the next day, the Lord said, give me something, and it flips right open to it. I was like, oh my goodness, I get it. Can you explain to the viewer what just took place? Well, with, with my son, whenever, when, yes. when, yes. uh, when the Lord said to me, prophesy his destiny, I just began to say what God had said about him that I knew God had said about him, that he would preach the gospel, that his feet would be up on the mountains, all mm -hmm. these kind of things. Well, when I did that, long story short, uh, it took me about 15 minutes to do the whole thing. 
That's like uh, it, nothing. How long had you been praying, been praying before that? I've been praying for two that? years. For two years I've been praying. And so in 15 minutes, I'm in the courts of heaven. I am repenting, dealing with legal issues. Then I am presenting the case before God. That's what prophesying his destiny was. This is what you said about him, Lord. Yeah. And so I was done in 15 minutes. And I really felt something had moved. Well, a week and a half later, my phone rings. And it's my son, Adam. And he says to me, Dad, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And he said, I don't know what happened. But a week and a half ago, all the depression left me. Wow. And he said, I'm ready to do God's will. Well, Adam now is back in ministry, leading his own church, took a church with five people in it in a town of 3,600 people, and is now has it in two years' time up to 120 people. He's also overseeing several other churches that the people he's with have given him responsibility for, and he's living out the destiny of God. And it all happened because I was able to deal with the legal issues that the enemy was using to stop Adam from his destiny. From two years to 15, to 15 minutes. minutes. Yes, and I tell people I did more in 15 minutes in the courtroom than what I've been able to do in two, in two years, years on the battlefield. Wow, wow. So people are saying right now, how in the world do I go to the court of heaven, mm -hmm. you know? So tell us a little more, explain, how, how can we get there? Well, I, I think that number one, when you understand there are three dimensions of prayer, which I spoke of earlier, we approach God as father, as friend, and, and as, as judge. judge. We don't right. always go to the court. We only go to the court when we feel like there's something resisting us in the spirit realm. All right, so prayer is still important. It's, oh yeah, fellowshipping with, 90% right. of my prayer time is fellowshipping with the father. Okay. That I, I, I only go to the court when I feel like something's not moving, when I'm asking God for something and it's not happening, yeah. uh, or I feel a resistance. Mm -hmm. But when I do, when I go to the court, it always involves, number one, repenting for myself, Lord, mm -hmm. any place that I'm, that I'm wrong, yeah. uh, repenting in the situation, because, you see, repentance takes away the legal right of the enemy to work against us. So do you, but you know, we're wrong. We mm -hmm. just blow it. So Absolutely. Wh what do you say? I'm repenting or it's almost, do you come in agreement? I, yeah, what I do is that it, according to Revelation 12, verse 10 and 11, that the accuser of the brethren, which is another Greek word, Catagoras, which means one who brings a complaint against us mm -hmm. in a judicial system. That's what that word means. Yeah. It says he is bringing that complaint 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Yeah. But then it says, but they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word mm. of their testimony, and they love not their life and their death. So the thing that takes away the case of the devil is Jesus' blood. Lord, I repent and I thank you that your blood is now speaking for me in the courts and that every case the enemy is using to resist my prayers from being answered, Lord, your blood is answering that. Wow. And well, so, so we yeah. learn how to use the blood of Jesus in the courts of heaven to answer the cases that are against us. Wow, that makes that that's just and it changes everything. 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 Just absolutely everything. And then I tell people once once that's happened, now make your request one more time. Yeah. Now say, Lord, the cases against me is dismissed. The thing the enemy is using against me is removed. Now, Lord, I'm asking you one more time. And I have watched God answer so many people's prayers. I could give you testimony after, after testimony, testimony of my life and many others yeah. that have used this principle to see breakthrough come. And is this life. kind of the case? Because there is those people, it's almost like there's curses against them because yes. it's just one thing. And, and they're not little, they're huge. That's right. Absolutely huge. You know, like everything is being taken and swept away from them. Now, the bloodline, I've heard you talk about yes. before about the bloodline. Yeah. What? Well, you know? this is part of the case that the enemy uses. He uses, David spoke in Psalms 32 and Psalms 51 of sin, transgression, and iniquity. Sin and transgression are our own personal stuff. Yeah. Okay? But iniquity is the sin that's in the bloodline. That, that our forefathers, those who lived before us, they, they gave themselves over to certain realms of sin. That becomes an iniquity in the bloodline that the devil uses to, to bring curses against us. We have to repent for ourselves and the sins of our fathers. This is what Daniel, Hezekiah, and Nehemiah did. Wow. When they were trying to get the children of Israel out of captivity, they repented for the sin of their fathers that had allowed the enemy the legal right to bring them into captivity wow. in the first place. Makes sense. Like Adam had the... That's right. With the, Adam, we're all the way stuck still That's with right. the same problem. That's so right. you've got to repent. So do you basically say, Lord, show me what is standing in the way if you don't know? Yes. What I tell people is, I, I tell them two things. One, if you want to see the iniquity in your bloodline, 
Look at your parents, look at you and your siblings and your children. Wow. Yeah. You will see iniquitous patterns in those three generations. You okay. should, like for instance, there's anger in my bloodline. There's violence in my bloodline. There's sexual issues in my bloodline. So you repent of that? I repent of all that. I say, wow. Lord, I repent, not just for myself, but for these issues that I know are in my bloodline. Wow. I'm asking you to please forgive us for this. In any place these things came in. Right. And so I began to repent for that. The other thing that I do is that I say, Lord, if, if I'm not, if there's something I'm still not saying, show would me. you just speak to show me? Show me. Yeah. And yeah. God's spoken to me in dreams many times. Yes, to me too. And, and I'm learning about all this yes. and it's exciting. Now, there's a lot more to this, of course. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants to get your books or get a hold of you, what's your website? Uh, Robert Henderson, my name, dot org. RobertHenderson.org, okay. and wow. all of our material is there, especially those these two books and the material connected to them, Operating in the Courts of Heaven and Unlocking Destiny wow. from the Courts of Heaven. Uh, both of these are very significant books that, that yeah. are helping literally thousands of people. Wow, Robert, thank you so much thank for you. giving me the honor Bless you. to interview you. you. So, and, and you're hearing this and you're learning this, and I know you have prayers, I know you have concern, and I know that you want more. Well, guess what? So does God. He wants to give you more. So go get it. Get after it. Call us. Let us pray for you. Let us minister to you. 855-515-5550 or go to our website, barbtv.org. And I just want to leave you with one more word because you're saying, I can't do this. But guess what? You can. And it says, my child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. And then in verse 9 it says, Then you will understand what is right, just, and fair, and you will find the right way to go. God loves you. He will never leave you. Why don't you go get it? See you soon. The vast majority of Americans still believe in God, but there are strong signs that many are less certain about their belief, about this belief than in years past. But it didn't start like that. It started very differently. Tell me a little bit, what happened? Because you were raised in a Christian family, but your dad wasn't really there, right? Um, some really, really powerful healing happened with my wife. My wife had been really? through sexual abuse. and. Yeah, some real powerful stuff came out. And They're caring, passionate. I see you on fire. <laughs> and there is a difference. Now, yeah. what is it? Because that's what people want. You so know? so here, here's the key. Here's the big gold nugget. Intimacy. And I thought... That's I it? That's like, it's it. that simple? That, it's that. It is intimacy. intimacy.